Hello, welcome to EverydayHDR.com. My name is Blake Rudis, and today I want to talk about haloing. I recently had a YouTube subscriber ask me how to fix halos in Photoshop, but, you know, I figured I could do that tutorial, which I will eventually do that tutorial. It'll be next week. But I wanted to show you how to avoid haloing altogether in Photomatix, because uh, that's the first part in combating haloing, is just not making it happen. A lot of times people over HDR the image, they over tone map it, and in over tone mapping it, they like what they see in the foreground, but in the background, they get that nasty haloing where they get that transition between foreground and background, usually between two areas of high contrast. So what I'm going to do is show you this, the adjustment sliders here in Photomatix that cause uh, our haloing to happen and how you can avoid that. So I'm going to just go ahead and show you right now the, the concoction for the nastiest halo you can possibly imagine. Because when you know which sliders do that, you tend to avoid it. I avoid haloing altogether in Photomatix. I would rather um, have a under tone mapped photo than have the halos. Because a lot of times that a halo alerts me that, hey, you're tone mapping this image a little too far. So the first uh, nasty recipe here, uh, ingredient to our nasty recipe for halos is the luminosity. If the luminosity is all the way down, the lighting effects, people tend to put surreal plus on there, and then the white point tends to go up. Now, that is the concoction for a nasty halo. I mean, you can see it. It's a blaring halo right now. It doesn't look so hot right now. So, you can avoid this really easily starting out in your lighting adjustments by going to something like medium or natural plus. I tend to prefer natural or natural plus as, as my go-to options. Now we still have this haloing happening here, but the haloing is happening from those highlights now, not necessarily between that area of contrast. So you can increase the luminosity, which will help, and I really suggest decreasing the white point. So let's see if we can work with this here. I added some black point. The minute I added some black point, because that, that image with the black point all the way down does not look good at all. Add some black point to give you a black reference point. Um, add some white point. We start to get some blowouts up here in the sky. Not too bad. We can fix that later in Photoshop. Um, what's our strength? If we move our strength up, we start to get more, a more, of a, a, more effect here of our tone mapping. Increase saturation. Too much. Way too much. This barn was pretty red, but it wasn't that red. It wasn't blood red. All right. So you can see this is coming along pretty nicely now with no haloing here. The minute I drop the luminosity, I start to get halos. If I bring up that white point, I start to get halos. So let's see if I add that Surreal Plus. I get halos. So keep it away from Surreal Plus. I usually never go beyond medium. Medium is about as far as I go. It's usually between natural and natural plus is where I will go. So I like the way natural looks here. I don't like the luminosity all the way down, so let's increase that. White point, don't like that either. So this is actually probably where I would get with this photo right here. And then I would take this into Photoshop. I would save this as a 16-bit um, TIFF and then I'd work on it in Photoshop a little bit further. This is a good HDR image right here, contrary to popular belief, because you can take this a little bit further with post-processing in a second here. So I can go to File, um, oh, let me process this first. I'll just go ahead and uh, show you what I would do in Camera Raw at this point. So we've reduced all haloing in here by avoiding haloing altogether, right? So if we go to File, Save As, Make sure you save this as a 16-bit TIFF. It's really important that you save your HDR images right out of Photomatix as a 16-bit TIFF because you can do a lot more work with them later. Now, I took five RAW files, dropped them right into Photomatix, so I had a lot of dynamic range with those five RAW files in, in uh, Photomatix. Now, if I save this as a JPEG, you pretty much kick all that stuff out the door. So save it as a 16-bit TIFF. I know it's, really, it's a really hefty file, but it will help you in the long run. So I'm going to go ahead and save this to my desktop. And let me go on my desktop real quick and open that up. Okay, so in here I'm in camera raw. 
I always come straight into camera roll right after Photoshop and how you do that, I'll show you that in a second after I, uh, or not Photoshop, pardon me, Photomatix. After Photomatix, I come right into camera roll. From camera roll, I can start adding any more adjustments I want. So what I like to do in Photomatix is get a nice baseline image, just baseline HDR, nothing fancy, nothing too dark, nothing too light, nothing too stylized, just right. So here is where I'll play with the highlights and the uh, shadows. You can press Alt in Camera Raw or Option on a Mac to see how what's blowing out in those areas. So right there you see, uh, and I can't really hover over it, but that white dot is blowouts in your whites. Blowouts in your reds are also happening there and increasing and increasing. You see some blowouts in the blues. So when you press and hold Alt, you can see what you're doing to your photograph um, as far as highlights and shadow blowouts. I like to leave a little bit, just a couple dots, nothing, just a reference point for white. It gives your eye a place to rest. Same thing for the shadows. You can press and hold Alt or Option to see how far um, your shadows or your whites are being taken. Now, I do like to increase my shadows right out of, out of Photomatix, and the reason why is because a shadow existed here underneath this ledge. If you overtone map something, you will no longer have a shadow there, and it does not look good. You have to remember, with HDR photography, you still want to maintain highlights and shadows. If you don't, you lose all the depth in the image, and what you have left is a flat, really detailed, really flat work in the end. And it's, it's not really that attractive, especially to the, the trained HDR eye. Now, when you first look at it, you're probably like, wow, this is so cool. Look at all these colors and all this detail. That fades real quick. So just keep that in mind. It's still a photograph. It still has a differentiation between highlight and shadow. So go ahead and keep that. Same thing here. Alt on the on the whites and the blacks just to increase those just a little bit more. I mean, I could take this real far, but eh, I don't like the way that looks. You see what happens here. Those are shadow clipping is happening right there. So those areas have no real information in them anymore, and it's really clipping in those red areas pretty bad. So I'm going to take that up until it starts to clip off there. You can increase the clarity a little bit if you'd like to, to add a little bit more drama to your HDR image. But remember, you already tone map this, so the higher you take it, just the more dramatic it's going to look and uh, the more over-processed it's going to look. Overcooked, if you want to call it that. Over-baked, if you want to call it that, you can call it that as well. Saturation, I might increase the saturation just a little bit, but I'd probably increase the saturation in different areas altogether, um, like the white, the in each area individually. Overall temperature. This is, this is kind of a uh, sunset-ish, right around sunset, so plus three or plus four in there is not going to be too bad. So then what I do is I go right into the detail adjustment slider, or adjustment module, and, and go ahead and reduce the, uh, the noise there. Just a very easy, common, nothing too, too fancy, just a luminous about 20, luminous detail about 42. That's about right. What I was saying before about individually uh, attacking the saturation is I would go into the um, hue saturation slider, go to saturation, and you can here you can control the colors individually. And I think you have a lot more control over your saturation that way. I don't like to increase the saturation globally. I think it looks horrible. So you can increase the luminance of just the yellows. Now you can, or not, pardon me, the saturation of the yellows. You can also increase the luminance, how dark that yellow appears, how light that yellow appears. Um, which can be really awesome for dramatic effect. You can also adjust the hue of it too. If you didn't like the color of that green, you, it, like there it's like a yellowish green, but if you wanted it to be more of a, uh, of a darker green, maybe a spring green, you can increase that as well. Now you'd be surprised, the green sliders, here we have green in this image, but typically uh, anything green is probably gonna be mainly controlled in your yellows. It sounds odd, but it's, it's true. Reds as well. You can increase the red, or sorry, this is the uh, hue of the reds. I don't want to change the hue of the reds because that's pretty much the hue that that, uh, that that barn was. But I can increase the saturation of that red, uh, and the luminance of that red, make it a darker red. It was pretty dark. So you see, you don't have to get so strung up in uh, photomatics that you have to get the perfect image because you have to still look at that, that photo in Photomatix as being a negative. It's still a digital negative. Um, I know I went a little farther than I was supposed to with this one, but it's kind of important to understand that you don't have to take your tone mapping to the extent that you think you have to take it in Photomatix because you're going to be 
post-processing it later. Think of your tone mapped file as a negative. It needs to go to the digital darkroom and get fixed later. So don't try and stress it too far in Photomatics. Just get a nice baseline image that has the detail. It's not too light, not too dark, not too stylized. By stylized, I mean uh, overly dramatic or overly tone mapped. That will be your key to success with uh, your, your HDR images. So in the beginning, we covered the adjustment sliders that uh, avoid haloing, and we transitioned into um, some post-processing stuff here in Photoshop. The reason why I wanted to get into this post-processing stuff is because uh, you know, leaving you with just that image wouldn't necessarily be fair. In my opinion, you know, I could tell you, oh yeah, then you got to post process it. But if I didn't show you how I'd post process it, eh, it doesn't really help you too much. So beyond this, I would take this into Photoshop and continue going even more. But that would make this tutorial probably another 20 to 30 minutes because that's typically about how much time I spend on one photograph. It's usually between 20 to 30, sometimes 45 minutes in in the post processing part. So. I hope this helped with your halo reduction. Remember, those halo sliders are going to be your luminosity slider, your um, lighting adjustments. If you put it up real high into the surrealistic plus, it's not good, and uh, your luminosity adjustment. Luminosity, white point, and um, what was that other one? I just said it. lighting adjustments, surreal plus. Stay away from those. Work with them individually. If, if you see that it's taking it too far, Go ahead and stop yourself, take a break, walk away, and re-attack it. All right, my name is Blake Rudis, again with EverydayHDR.com, and this was Fixing Halos and Venturing Even into Some Post-Processing in Photoshop. Thank you, and have a great weekend.